This guy has interviewed the likes of Grant Cardone, Ed Milet, Gary Vee at this point. Like, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've taken away from these guys? That's number one is like A players only. Number two is successful people are in the order business, but mega successful people are in the reorder business. And then number three is that they're all I am interviewing another podcast host. This guy has interviewed the likes of Man, Grant Cardone, Ed Milet, I think Gary Vee at this point, like pretty much everybody you could imagine that I one day want to interview. So I'm really just trying to be as cool as this guy. I got none <laughs> other than Omar Elatar, host of The Passionate Few. What's up, man? What's going on, Ryan? Honored to be here, brother. Yeah, dude. So I just got done filming with your podcast here in the set. And I, I got to be honest with you. I've been on a lot of different podcasts and the questions you asked and how you delivered them, you pulled a lot out of me that I've never had other hosts pull out of me. So how do you attribute that skill? Like, how'd you yeah. learn to do that? Um, yeah, to be honest with you, I think it's twofold. Number one, I've just always been a genuinely interested person. When I was a kid, I was alone a lot. So I was always like reading books and into documentaries. And I would do this like weird thing where even if I was like driving, if I would see someone, uh, I think it's because I was alone a lot as a kid. So I had to entertain myself. So when I was alone a lot as a kid, I would see different people. And I always was wondering about their story. Like if there's a guy driving or like, um, you know, across the block, there was a Vietnamese guy who owned a dry cleaner and he owned that dry cleaner. I saw him my whole life growing up mm -hmm. and I always wondered like, what was his story? So he'd tell me, yeah, I came here back then and then I started the store, but then me and my wife struggled. And so just from, from when I was a little kid, I was always asking questions and genuinely curious to know people's story. And fortunately later I found a vehicle to be able to indulge that, uh, that passion. That's awesome. So Tell people who've never heard your podcast, you know, how long you guys been doing it? Yeah. What's the premise? Who's been on it? Yes. So we've been doing the podcast for a couple of years now. And uh, within the first year, that's when we got a lot of the big names, the Grant Cardone, the Ed Milet, Tom Bilyeu, billion dollar uh, founder of Quest Nutrition. We also got the creator of Hot Cheetos. And so a lot of people know us because early on we got really big names really fast. And I used to do crazy stuff like sleep outside of places or, and I was telling you before off camera that. Um, like when I first got Grant Cardone on the show, I think it was like 2017 or something before like the podcast boom really started. And so just early on, I just wanted to get big names as fast as possible. I didn't care about uh, like money or brand. I was just, I was in a place where I was kind of like, um, depressed and I wanted to change my life. And so I just went at it. My <laughs> life coach was like, if life was perfect, what would you do? And so I just chipped away at the podcast. Wow. That's kind of how it started. Super cool, man. So tell me just like, you talked about depression and a life coach and all that. I mean, what were you doing before you're interviewing all these guys? Yeah. So actually it was funny because I, I told you this, uh, Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street had interviewed me on his podcast and I talked a lot about kind of the mental health stuff I went through early on. But at that time, I think I was like 24, 25 and very similar to you having the baseball dream that kind of didn't pan out how you wanted. When I was a kid, I always wanted to get paid to play, right? I wanted to be a master of craft. So first I wanted to be a professional soccer player and then I wanted to be a professional actor and then I wanted to be a professional skateboarder. And I always had a little bit of success and momentum in them, but I found myself, um, you know, with skateboarding, I started to get really good. Later got to work in the industry. I got to travel on tour with like Rob Deerdick and uh, a lot of the top pro skaters in the world. But long story short, I didn't go pro. So I found myself with all these hopes and dreams in my mid twenties and I just got whatever jobs I could before the podcast, man. Similar to you, I was just trying stuff. So I would flip stuff in the penny saver. If I don't know if people know what that is, I would flip like video games in the penny saver, uh, different computer parts. And then I uh, worked in solar, uh, knocking door to door, selling $30,000 solar, solar panels to people who don't want you at their door. And uh, I ended up doing well there. And then I got recruited to Tesla and did that for a while. So that's kind of my career before the podcast, so to uh, speak. What were you doing at Tesla? I uh, was a sales rep. So I actually sold Teslas and... Do sales reps even sell Tesla? Like, it, it seems like it just sells itself. Yeah. Well, that's the premise. There's no negotiating or anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's the, that's the premise um, uh, with Tesla is make the product so good that it come, you know, that customers come to you. But working for Tesla and getting to see how Elon, even from a very high level, worked with the team was really inspiring because even though there was like teams and systems and it wasn't direct communication... We'd sometimes get emails about like sales numbers from Elon with misspellings and like, <laughs> like he would chew people out or say good job. Like he was just very raw with how he would email um, like a lot of the, the sales reps and um, top producers and stuff. So it was a great experience, man. But I was making, I don't know if we can share, but 
I'll give you the exclusive. I was making like 15 bucks an hour and then $7 per test drive and then $100 commission per car sold. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, I mean, what does that come out to a year? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, not even six figures, you know? Not even close. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> a, so so I, that's, that's the challenge is like, I literally had all these dreams. I was like, oh, I'm going to do this and I'll make all this money. And, you know, I had all these dreams that just never panned out. And I found myself working in a mall selling Teslas and no disrespect, I love Tesla, but I just knew for me, I was meant for something more. So I was kind of at a precipice of uh, inspiration and desperation at that time. So what happened? So long story short, one day, the, the life coach, shout out Dave Thorpe. He was, he was my life coach at the time. I barely had any money to my name, but I knew the power of investing in mentors. So I had invested in, in, in him to kind of help me with this funk. And long story short, I had a breakup with an ex and simultaneously, I just, I got sober, that relationship ended. And then uh, I quit my job at Tesla just on a whim of like, <laughs> screw it, I'm going to go all in on this dream, even though I have no idea how to monetize it, what it is. I just felt so like, I don't know, like I just, something in me. Um, yeah, I'm a man of faith. So I just, I feel like God told me just go for it, you know, just lean in. And thankfully I did. And, and it's funny because the, she had the girl that I was with at the time, I mentioned this on Jordan Belford's podcast too. It was just funny. Um, she had broken up with me and that was like, you know, as a guy in your twenties, that's like an ego thing, right? Like how could she break up with me? You know, at that time mm -hmm. I was always the one that broke up with girls. So I was like kind of like devastated, but in a bad place. So in a weird way, the, the desire to start the podcast was born 50% from me wanting to, to do something inspiring like that. My coach was like, if life was perfect, what would you do? said I would find a way to make millions of dollars, inspire millions of people and have inspiring conversations with people I, I respect. And the other half of it was she, my ex-girlfriend at that time who broke up with me, she was a huge fan of Grant Cardone. Um, she loved Quest Bars and she loved Hot Cheetos. <laughs> so, I love all those things too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in, a, in a crazy, weird, motivational way, I used that, that chip on my shoulder to uh, do whatever it took to get interviews with the billion dollar creator of Hot Cheetos, billion dollar creator of Quest, Tom Bilyeu and Grant Cardone. And that first year I did the impossible and interviewed all three. And the show just blew up right away. I got hundreds of thousands of views per video. The podcast blew up pretty quick. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. About those three people, let's talk about them individually. Mm -hmm. So the Hot Cheetos guy, I've heard this story. Wasn't he like a janitor? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. He was a janitor making $3 an hour at uh, the Frito-Lay plant, shout out Mr. Montanez, uh, which is crazy because I found out through him later that 20th Century Fox is actually producing a movie on his life. Mm. And I believe um, the people that wrote the script and made the movie had watched our interview. Mm. So the pieces of the interview ended up going on like Good Morning America and just started getting all this like press. But uh, his story's crazy. He literally was a janitor making $3 an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, one day he just got inspired and he, he um, cold call through the directory, the CEO. <laughs> and they were like, what the heck? Why is the janitor calling the CEO? And he kept trying and pitching him this idea. And so for months, they turned him down, turned him down. Long story short, they ended up uh, having him come down and present. They presented. And as we all know today, it's in North America. Frito-Lay's Hot Cheetos is the best-selling uh, product in North America. Really? Yeah. I did so, not know that. So his, uh, his idea laid birth to this huge thing. And he ended up getting promoted to I believe the title was vice president of PepsiCo North America for uh, Latin markets or something like that. So he they literally became a billionaire. Um, well, I don't know the splits or the yeah. how, how it works, but I mean, hot Cheetos have generated <laughs> billions and billions <laughs> yeah, yeah. and billions of dollars. That's so, yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. I remember someone, they probably heard it from your podcast, honestly. Now I'm thinking about it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, somebody told me that they're like, yeah, this guy used to just make his own Cheetos hot. And yeah. he's like, they're really good. Yeah, with his, with his wife. And they just yeah. won it and they went to test markets to pitch it. And so I saw on Yahoo like a little story about it, but there was no interviews. And I realized he lived in California. And again, I, when I started the podcast, I had no money, no experience. Similar to you, I maxed out my credit cards to do whatever it could to just wing funding the show. I didn't know right. anything other than the fact that I was like, oh, that's an epic story. And like, how cool would it be to like, my ex-girlfriend, every time she eats hot Cheetos, no, like, haha, like, Dude, got the I, last laugh now. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta my, say, hot yeah. Cheetos are my favorite snack, period. <laughs> like, you give me a bag of chips, I'm asking you for a hot Cheeto, easily. Um, so tell me about the other end of the spectrum, the healthy side, Tom yeah. Bilyeu. 
mm-hmm. bus bars. Yeah. So both of them were very hard to track. I mean, even Cardone, but with Tom Bilyeu at that time, I had DM'd him probably, you know, now we all know him for impact theory and they've got millions of subscribers. But at the time, a couple of years ago, I had DM'd him maybe like 14 times and he didn't respond. <laughs> so I would just try everything, man. I would like email, text. I tried to find like the info number. I would just do whatever it could. I would try to find their assistant's Instagram and then add their assistant. Like I was a networking ninja because I was so committed to the vision of like, I don't know how or why or whatever. Kind of like you were saying with sport. I was just committed to the outcome regardless of the logic of why it's scary to do it. And just kept messaging him. And literally just the 14th time I messaged him, uh, Tom messaged me back like, hey, dude, thanks for your persistence. Sure, I'd love to do an interview. Can you come to my house in Beverly Hills on this day at this time? Like it just worked like that. Wow. Just, yeah, it just kept knocking and- Just follow up. Yeah, follow up. Like you were saying with your wife. I had to follow <laughs> up with my wife a lot. So- <laughs> And here I am. That, yeah. that was about the last time I followed up. Um, <laughs> I'm like such a bat. You know, you, there's, there's sales guys who are really good. They'll grind it out and follow up nonstop. And then there's the sales guys that are like, hey, if it doesn't close that time, they're done. And mm-hmm. they're on to the next. And that's how I am. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm a, they said no, whatever. Yeah. I, I see that later, but I, I think in business, I, I see the both perspectives, but you got to understand at that time, I was so driven that like, Literally, like even for the hot Cheetos guy, it was I was always elegantly persistent. Like I wasn't mm-hmm. uh, I wasn't aggressive or anything, but I literally hit. I got it got to the point with the hot Cheetos guy where I had DM'd him, emailed him, coincidentally found out who his tailor was, <laughs> and had the tailor like send a message to him for his suits. That didn't work, and then I finally saw that he had a speaking engagement. So I went to a speaking engagement and pitched him. You know, I built rapport, talked to him a little bit, pitched him on coming on the podcast. And he said, no. And he's like, I've even turned down Oprah. <laughs> so I said, I said, okay, I understand. And then I went to another speaking event that he was at like three months later. And f- I did that over and over. And then like the third or fourth event, he was just like, man, you don't give up. Fine, I'll do your podcast. That's and now funny. we've become the best of friends and, and I got to connect with him. And he's, he's, a, he's a cool buddy of mine now. That's crazy. So, yeah. So the last guy on that list, Cardone, how'd you get him? Oh, that's, pr- that's probably the most famous story. <laughs> so Cardone was, was crazy. Um, Basically, I live in LA, California, and um, he's in Florida. So I saw on their Instagram story uh, that they were on vacation in town in California. And I heard on the Instagram story very, very faintly, his wife, Elena, saying, hey, Grant, are we still on for dinner at you know, the spot in Beverly Hills at like 8 o'clock or 7.30? I forget what it was. And he was like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. But it was very faint in the background. Like it wasn't even what he was talking about or showing. But I had heard that and I remember thinking to myself... <laughs> I won't show up. <laughs> yeah. I wonder like, cause there's a lot of different paths and doors, but like the best way is just direct face to face. Right. Right. Uh, and again, chip on my shoulder. Like, Oh, what would, what would the ex think about that? Like, that'd be crazy. Cause I didn't know about Cardone. She actually introduced me to him. Mm-hmm. And so in my heartbroken mind at that time, I was just like, that would be so cool. <laughs> I was like, screw it. Let's try it. You know? So long story short, I, I drove down there and, um, Wait, waited outside the restaurant for like two hours. I went like staked out the place, finally saw them. And for two hours, dude, I waited outside because I didn't want to be a stalker and like go in and interrupt the dinner. I was like, let me just elegantly approach them when they walk out. So for two hours, I like, I literally waited outside and every time the door would open from the restaurant, people coming out, my heart would race to see if it was him. And then it wasn't race. And then it wasn't. So for two hours, I'm going through this mental anxiety attack. Finally, they come out and uh, I just go up to Grant and and I talk to him and I'm like, hey, big fan, Grant. You know, I, I drove a couple hours to be here and he's like, oh, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And then uh, I, I learned from his stuff, like all, all of my sales skills that I learned from Tesla and door to door, I used to get him on the podcast because I knew that there was, I had no podcast at the time. Like he was one of the first. So I literally approached him from a perspective of like, I brought up all his objections, right? Like, like, hey, Grant, by the way, you know, it's nice to meet you, but um, I, I'd i love to ask for a favor from you. And I know you'll probably say no because, um, uh, you know, I don't have a brand yet. I haven't interviewed any guests. I'm brand new, but I have a podcast that's in pre-production right now. And we're interviewing a lot of heavy hitters. At the time, it wasn't entirely true, <laughs> but I needed a justification for why we didn't have any content now or brand now. So I said, and I'd love to have you in the lineup. We'll come to you in Malibu. It'll be, you know, we'd be in and out in an hour. I know you're in town and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, he was like, you really drove two and a half hours, three hours here to uh, 
just to ask me that? I was like, yes, sir. Can, you know, consider me the young man you once were looking for a chance. And he was just like, all right, dude, I, I like you, man. I'll give you an interview. Two days later, we interviewed him in Malibu. And it, at that time, for like a year or two, it became the most watched and downloaded interview with Grant and Elena on the internet, mm. YouTube and podcast worldwide. How many uh, views did it again? Hundreds of thousands. I probably, probably like over 200K, 300K. But yeah. at that time... He wasn't like that crazy yet. Yeah, he wasn't that crazy and he wasn't on everybody, you know, he wasn't on everybody's podcast at that time. So it was kind of like very weird because you have to understand too, by the way, for context, I'm totally broke at this time. So I'm interviewing him, carrying this conversation about business. But I literally, I remember at that time, I didn't even have gas money to get to Malibu. I had to have a buddy give me a ride to the interview. <laughs> you're watching this show. My guess is you're probably an entrepreneur who's trying to grow your business. And for me, the best thing I ever did to grow my business was build my personal brand on social media. It's allowed me to get more revenue. It's allowed me to raise more capital and it's allowed me to hire better talent. And if you are not currently creating content, for your brand, you're missing out and your competition is. So if you want to learn to grow, my advice is to create a podcast. Now there's a lot that goes into building a podcast and why I believe it's the best way. So I've actually created a free training that I want you to go check out. If you go to panadamedia.com slash podcast, you can go access the free training right now and see how a podcast is going to be the best decision to grow your personal brand today. So go check it out by clicking the link below and I'll see you in the training. With all these guys you've interviewed, man, I mean, now you've been doing this for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you, you've learned a lot. You know, I, I look at what you're doing, um, you know, my buddy Lewis House, he's been doing it for a long time as well and interviewed a lot of very smart people along the way. Um, I mean, it's cool to carry conversations with them and talk, but mm -hmm. like, what are some of the biggest lessons that you, you can just, that you've taken away from these guys? Yeah, there's, there's a lot, but I, I think there's like three common denominators. I'm asked this so much. The, the number one thing I noticed, uh, for example, and I noticed it most evidently as I went up the wealth scale, we interviewed, um, um, uh, multi-billionaire John Paul DeJoria, who's the founder of Patron Tequila and Paul Mitchell Shampoo and Conditioner. Okay. And I had just interviewed him, um, like I think it was a couple months after he had sold Patron to Bacardi for like $5.1 So he was <laughs> he was on a high at that point. And, um, you know, I'm thinking like this guy, and for context, he was homeless twice by the time he was 37. He's, a, he's an older guy. He's like the 45th wealthiest person in America. And so when I was with him, interviewing him, I noticed, because I'm, I'm wondering, like, how does this guy run? It's hard to run one million dollar company, you know, this multi-million dollar company, several, but imagine two multi-billion dollar companies with thousands of employees. Like, how do you, you do that? And so uh, I asked him that and I, and I noticed more from his example, his answer, but it was team. Yep. It was the people. During the setup of the interview, it probably took uh, 30 minutes to set up. He was sitting in his office with us, kind of joking around. And I noticed probably like 20, 30 people come to his office, pop in with a question and a signature. Hey, what do we want to do about this? And he'd make very quick decisions. So he'd make very quick decisions and he'd be, and then he'd be like, I trust Amanda to, to handle that. Somebody else would come in, like, tell Steve that's okay. So it was a very high, le he, he, had, he had built a very high leverage team. And even he told me that, that that's, that's really the key. Like you're one or two hires away from an entirely new universe of a business or a business partner away from that. Mm -hmm. So that's number one is like A players only. Yep, I agree. Um, number two is, um, uh, and I got this advice for him, is he said that successful people are in the order business, but mega successful people are in the reorder business. Mm, they can repeat customers. Repeat customers, right? Uh, and you know this because you have companies where, you know, people will do business with one or two or three or four, you know, all of your companies mm -hmm. because there's that vertical integration. So that's the other thing, number two. And then number three is that they're all willing to like try a lot of different things and pivot quickly and mm. not get very emotional about those pivots. Um, those are probably like the top three because most people, and I'm sure you know this, most people who have success have pivoted quite a few times, whereas other people who those same challenges may have happened to may have reacted differently. And as a result, they don't have the same success that the person responded to it better at, you know, yeah. like the same things happen to us all, how we respond to them. That's what dictates where we go. Yeah. It's funny. You know, I pivot a lot and for some who maybe are new to my companies and stuff, it, it can definitely make them uncomfortable because they're like, mm -hmm. where are we going? There's no clear direction. Like right. this, this ship's going crazy. 
Yeah. And it's like, no, this is like a normal everyday thing. Yeah. And you have to hold it together as a CEO and, you know, yeah. be organized. But even in your head, if you're like, oh, shit, what do I, I don't yeah. even know what to do, but I got to act like I have it together. <laughs> well, it's just like we have to try something new, right? Mm-hmm. Because if it's clearly not working, then you have to try something new. Yeah. And sometimes you try five different things and none of them work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like, well, it's better than just doing the same thing over and over that doesn't work, right? You got to just keep trying new things until you find the path and eventually you find the path. And Mm -hmm. I can tell you in our companies, they've all been like that. Now it's tough where you might come into a new company and you're trying to find your path and you know, you don't know that going into it. You never saw the other companies four years ago Mm -hmm. (laughs) going through the same thing. And now they're machines because they went through all those pivots and adaptions and everything else. And so I think um, for anyone listening, watching this, and if you feel like one of two things, if you feel like one, you're stuck in the same place and you're scared to pivot, pivot, just do it. Mm -hmm. Two, if you feel like you've pivoted a lot and none of it's been successful, that's okay. Keep pivoting Mm -hmm. because you're eventually, if you find enough things that don't work, (laughs) you find the one that does. Exactly. A process of elimination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people get very emotional about testing things. You know, I, um, I, I came to this realization one time. It's like, I find it super interesting that when I interview a lot of these successful people, just naturally I've had the privilege of like, and I, and you too, I know you know this is like, when you go on their jets or you go behind the scenes, you, you sometimes see what's behind the persona, the truth. Uh, sometimes there's wisdom and great conversations that happen. You're like, oh, I wish we got that on camera, right? And like one of the most common things I've heard, and Grant Cardone is a perfect example of this. Uh, he told me, he's like, dude, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> like you just wing your incompetence and little by little you become a little, You kind of like Hermosi says, you start sucking less. Yeah. But you're just winging it. Even even uh, JP, I told him, I said, you know, you have thousands of employees, you know, billions of dollars, multiple billions of dollars a year in revenue and all these companies. And he goes, Omar, truth be told, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, you know, I'm winging it. You just get better at winging it. And uh, I think that's that's a huge thing too, is they're willing to take risks and make decisions even without all the information. Yeah, you have to. And look, it, there's ways to wing it less, right? You know, you want to start flipping houses today. Obviously, you could join Future Flipper. You're going to get a blueprint and, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be way better. Um, but there still will be elements to winging it because you executing a plan is very different than me, right? You have mm-hmm. different skill sets. You have different strengths, et cetera. But even to the point of once you start having a lot of success, you really have to start winging it because there's no buddy to reach out to for going through what you're going right, through. Exactly. Yes. Like the tequila guy has no, who's he going to talk to? Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, I remember when I was starting to do TikTok and no business people were really doing it. Mm-hmm. I was winging it. I'm like, I'll try this. I'll try dancing. I'll try this style, that style. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, we kind of found what worked and then it became, you know, a cool thing. Mm-hmm. But, um, everything is winging it. And I, I tell you know, we got tykes coming. Oh, by the time this launches, tykes have already been out. But, you know, one of the elements of tykes is we don't know what we're doing. Mm-hmm. This is totally a new frontier. We are going to try anything and everything under the sun. And we're going to find out in the coming years what sticks mm-hmm. in this space. And that's the only way. We just don't know. Yeah, exactly. You know, totally. And being willing to commit to that first. Like, even first time I connected with Grant, like uh, in this capacity, he was telling me how they started, like, he wanted to run an offer. And so literally that morning, he had his team come up with a funnel and a price point for an offer. No idea exactly what the deliverable was, but they threw it on his Instagram story that day and they generated sales. Mm -hmm. So within 24 hours, they had done six figures in sales. And he even told me, he's like, yeah, I have no idea what the hell we're going to do, but (laughs) we're going to make it valuable for people, you know? So so it's, uh, he talks about like, Grant's really good at this is like shrinking the time between thought and implementation. That way you can test faster shrinking that time horizon. So funny you said this because I just filmed a solo podcast Mm -hmm. um, where I gave all my thoughts about spending two days um, with Grant at his mastermind. It was a private event. But one of the things he said was exactly that. He goes, one thing I do better than everyone is I go from idea to monetization faster than anyone you've ever heard of or known. Dude, 100%. I've literally seen him at a table smoking a cigar it was me, him, and Ed Milet. I, in my head, I was like, what the heck am I even doing here? <laughs> How did this happen? Uh, who doesn't belong? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, it, it was surreal, surreal. Because I had interviewed, I've interviewed them both like two or three times. And one of, t- one of the times was together, the two of them together. Mm. So I got to even 
see like that level of interaction. It was so cool just being a fly on the wall to that. But I literally saw Grant with his right hand come up with an idea, send a voice memo to his team to set it up. And by the time we were done with the interview, that that thing was ready to go. And it was on his Insta story. So most people wouldn't do that. They talk about it, think about it, set up a meeting for next week about it. Two weeks go by, they debate if they should, and maybe they put something up in a month and it doesn't work. They kill the idea. You know, m most people um, let too much time in between the the the, the implementation. Hundred percent. Yeah, I um, he he gave an example of it um, at the event. He goes, "Hey, how many of you guys have signed up for the 10x Growth Con for next year?" Mm -hmm. And you know, a bunch of people at the event like, "Yeah, I signed up for it." This guy over here in the studio shaking his head. He's like, yeah, I signed up. And he goes, how many of you guys know where it is or when it is? And everyone's like, yeah, actually, I don't know. He's like, neither do I. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, exactly. he's already pre-selling it. Exactly. And yeah. he's like, why not pre-sell it? We don't yeah. need a venue. We don't need to know anything yet. Yeah. And he goes, it's actually better that we don't because there are people that um, if they knew the day or they knew the venue, they might not go because mm -hmm. they're like, oh, it's on the East Coast. I don't want to go to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's on this date. I got it whatever going on in the state, I can't go. But now everyone just buys it. Yes. I'm like, damn, that's smart. And I even thought about that with my NFT project. I'm very quick too, from idea to implementation, you know, with my NFT, mm -hmm. most people wait till mint day to mint. And um, that's when the revenue is generated. Right. And like, dude, we've been working on this thing for like eight months. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've been funding the whole thing myself. And I went to the team. I'm like, why do we have to wait till mint day to get paid? And like, really, lock people in and like mm -hmm. make sure we understand our demand and everything. And they're like, well, that's just what people do. I'm like, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to pre-sell. And so we pre-sell, um, which I've never seen a project do. We pre-sell in a way no one has. It was through credit card and Stripe and all this stuff. And sure enough, we sold over $2 million in less than a week. And pre -sell. I was like, pre-sell. Wow. And I was yeah. like, this is how entrepreneurs will do it going forward. Like I just created the new way to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was cause I was willing to test something that had never really been done before. And it was pretty much Grant's point of why can't we go to monetization now? Yeah. You don't need to deliver the product right now to get mm -hmm. paid. Yeah. You know? And so, um, and I think that also speaks to, um, brand. Like once you build a brand, cause most people, like there's a certain threshold of value you have to build with people to where somebody like yourself or a Cardone can can say that and because of the reputation behind your brand they know they can trust it mm -hmm. whereas other people could be like oh great like let me just pre-sell it <laughs> you know it's so Never there's a little happens. bit of the yeah exactly there's a little bit of i just want to emphasize that that is so important to really build that goodwill bank account which is really the power of building a personal brand you know yeah no one thousand percent it doesn't work if joe schmo's like yeah just give me money and it'll happen yeah like Sometime, somewhere, someday <laughs> <laughs> we, might, we might do it who knows yeah. but you know you even see it now with these things like the <laughs> whatever they are, the GoFundMes and stuff. Like mm -hmm. people are like, I got this idea. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. um, Tesla does it with the cyber truck. Everybody put their deposit for How many of you guys in here got a cyber truck like that are watching and are listening? Like, yeah, I think I put my deposit down years ago. Mm -hmm. Who knows when the cyber truck's going to happen? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you can start monetizing today if you're Tesla and everything else. So yeah. it's really funny. Um, really cool to see just like all that stuff. Was there anything else that really stuck out to you from any of these interviews? Yeah, man, there's so much. It's so hard to capture because I've done, God, dozens and dozens. I mean, I think we've done over 140 of them. And a lot of them, most of them were in person. Uh, the, the the one thing I would say, though, is like a lot of them, uh, I would say they're they're pretty calm, cool, collected about handling challenges. At least... Uh, at least calm, cool enough to get through it. I mean, who knows what goes on behind the scenes, right? Right. <laughs> Entrepreneurs, like there's a reason that, you know, it's... We're crazy. Uh, yeah, we're crazy. Even content creators, man. I know some huge names. Uh, I, you know, I won't say them, but I know huge, huge names, many of which we've talked about earlier on the podcast, who personally called me and just been like, man, I'm so burned out with creating content. Uh, to where it's like, ah, like, you know, hearing it from these guys with millions of subscribers and massive businesses, you're like, oh, okay. This is a universal thing that like everyone is in on. Like we realize the upside, but the challenge the difference is they do it anyways. You mm -hmm. know, and so they reap the benefits. Yeah. Yeah. I talked yeah. about that um, on your show. You know, I just, I'm not, I don't miss a day. If we got to film content, I won't miss a day. If you've watched me in the last three years, almost, well, two and a half years, uh, you know, there's never been a week where there wasn't a YouTube video. There's yeah. never been a week that a podcast was missed. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because the one thing like about building a personal brand, and you mentioned this earlier when we did the other podcast, if you guys want to check that out, 
Mm-hmm. Um, we'll link to that down below, guys, too, for, yeah. for Omar's podcast. Yeah, we, we got to interview you, but you were saying a great point about how building your personal brand attracts business opportunity. Like for me, even all the revenue streams we grew, they all kind of came like, like kind of like yours in the sense that it was organic. Like we were just creating content and then little by little, I started making AdSense revenue. And I was like, oh, this is cool. You make a couple hundred bucks and it's a couple thousand bucks. And then you're like, oh, we can, you know, there's a little leverage here. And then you get sponsors who are like, hey, can we sponsor some of your interviews? And then little by little, I started interviewing people and then they'd say, hey, well, I'm promoting this program or course. Um, do you want to be an affiliate? So I just put a link in the description and people would watch the interview and if they wanted to um, sign up for you know a two thousand dollar program or five thousand dollar program, I'd get an affiliate commission of fifty percent or whatever it was. And so little by little, all these revenue streams just started opening up. And I think it's a testament to the power of building like goodwill and value online. Like if you build value, doors will open up. WealthCon's coming back to Vegas January eighth to the eleventh. Now, if you've been to our events, you know how epic they are. We have the best time not only with just great content, great speakers, but we have a lot of fun with the after parties and the masterminds and everything else. And number one, it's the, probably the best networking opportunity in the entire game. We have over a thousand investors and entrepreneurs at each one, and this will be no different. In fact, this is gonna be my favorite WealthCon ever. We've got some amazing speakers coming, people like Tim Tebow, Thatch Nguyen, Gabrielle Lyon, the list goes on. It is going to be an epic event, and I wanna see you there. So if you're interested in attending, Get your tickets now because they will not last. Go to wealthcon.org and get them today. Everyone knows that my favorite way to build wealth is through real estate investing. That's the reason that I started Wealthy Investor, where we've trained thousands of students. But here's the thing. I've noticed that so many people fail to get started in real estate because they're worried about the money. They don't know where they're going to get the money to buy a house or flip or handle their renovations and things like that. And so they just never get started. I want to change that. And that's why I created a brand new free course that goes over five different ways that you could buy houses without using any of your own money today. And I'm going to give you it completely for free. All you have to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com slash podcast. I've made it specifically for you. The moment you go to that link, you'll be able to go get access to it and learn how you could start buying houses today without any of your own money. And if you're somebody who already has a real estate business and who wants to scale, we want to help you too. You can click the link below and book a free strategy call with our team if that's you. You were talking about this earlier. I I personally love interviewing people and talking to people. That's It's fun, right? It's fun. (laughs) I learn a lot. It's a good excuse to meet people that you wouldn't otherwise. Like I would never have been in half the rooms if I didn't have a mic and a camera crew. You crazy. Know, to think that that one variable can open up doors is crazy. I'm sure I'm sure you've seen that too. Yeah, no, it's crazy. I, I've said that before. Like this podcast is great for me because business partnerships have come. Right. Other things have come. <clears throat> I get to meet these people pre-show, post-show, hang out, talk. And, you know, uh, if you can bring if you can build your podcast up in a way where it's people want to be on it because it brings them value as well, it just creates this win-win. You yeah, know? no, to- totally. And then it's it's perfect because people get to know, like, and trust you. And we were talking about this earlier. One of the beauty, uh, one of the beauties of having a podcast is that people get to know your authentic voice. They get to know you and essentially build like a sense of trust and rapport with you before they meet you versus like a more tutorial type video. So like we've had a lot of clients we have a production company where we help um, a lot of executives and CEOs build their personal brand. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't hard sells where we're pushing them. Like when they call in or they inquire, they're fans of the show. They're fans of our work. They know the quality that we do. And so it just, it just makes everything smoother. It makes, you know what I mean? It's just mm-hmm. a smoother type of uh, way to run a business. I think in present day than to kind of be struggling in anonymity when your competitors are building their brand. Yeah, let's talk about this. You know, you you help people do their personal brands as well. Obviously, you're doing your podcast and everything. So, question for me. Yeah. Or <laughs> question I have as a podcast host, okay? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm looking at taking my podcast to the next level. I was actually going to talk to you about this off camera, but we might as well just talk about it on camera mm-hmm. so everyone can hear. So, these are kind of the questions I have, everyone listening, okay? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to show you my new studio <laughs> after this. We're going to rebrand the podcast. There's going to be... Um, you know, a totally kind of different element to it. You know, we're going to do some interviews just like this, but it's going to be more so with um, not just only business people, but mm-hmm. also people who, um, you know, health experts, uh, people in faith, people in um, 
you know, pop culture people and like all these things. It's going to be much more broad in the people we bring. I'm also going to be doing like a live show. Mm -hmm. And so talk a lot more about um, all the things that are happening live that day, you know, whether it's the news and uh, the market, whether it's some new crazy thing happened, like there's going to be a lot and I'm mm-hmm. going to have some co host and debate and other things. My question to you is with the way I've done it to this point, my guests have all been organic. Mm-hmm. Um, unlike you, I haven't really reached out to anybody. Mm-hmm. Definitely not 14 times. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. um, it, was, it was a hustle early on. Yeah, Definitely a hustle. Uh, most people that come on my show <laughs> are because they've reached out to me or the team and I'm just like, all right, let's do it. You know, cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, There's no like process behind it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do want to get more intentional with picking our guests now that we're going to have a more wide range of guests. So should I just hire like a podcast recruiter who's going to just DM all these people and Mm -hmm. try to get them booked on the show? Should I just hire a guy like you and who's already got a Rolodex and just be like, hey, like go book these guys on my show and whatever. Like, what do you think? Yeah. So I think it depends on like reverse engineering the outcome, right? So like, what's, what's the long-term vision? And the one thing I have seen, and I, I learned this because I got to go behind the scenes with uh, Tom Billy at Impact Theory. And I also got uh, to know a little bit about um, Matt, who's the guy who runs Joe Rogan's podcast Mm -hmm. and found out that that's like his full-time gig is like literally just booking. And so I put out a thing and I would I would try to get VAs. Like I went through different iterations of it. I used to DM, I got VAs to DM, I got people on my team to DM and outreach. But I have found that overall, having somebody manage that is so beneficial, dude, especially at the level you're at. You know, my answer would be different if it was somebody more novice, like beginner, but because you already have such a huge Rolodex and such a momentum, I think it would be massively beneficial for you to have um, some sort of automated system where like built into it, you have somebody who's filtering them, reaching out to them, coordinating. Cause there's no denying that like at the end of the game, it's just eyeballs. Right. So if you get big anchors, like have whoever you want, but make sure that, you know, for lack of a better expression, at least every few of them have mass appeal so that you're retaining those, those eyeballs. And so that it's filtered through the lens of like, Hey, Ryan Pineda's at the, at the level to where he can get this guy in the studio. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. it'll add a weight of uh, a value to the other guests too. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I learned this from, I had interviewed, do you know who David Lee is? The Ferrari collector, David Lee, he's like no. big on Instagram. So I interviewed him and he told me that when he was starting his business, so he's, I think he's, he's like Ferrari collector underscore David Lee. He's like one of the largest Ferrari collectors in North America. This guy uh, built his wealth through selling, um, he has like a, uh, it's like a whole, it's like a watch store or whatever, but it's luxury. It's like super upscale. So he told me that early on when he was building the business, he, you have to get the, uh, the deals with uh, Rolex and, uh, you know, all these other brands, but it was so hard to get brands cause they all want to know that you work with other brands, right? Like you're leveraging one, one name to get the other similar to podcasting. It's like, once you get Rolexes, then it's easier to get the other watch dealers. So I remember he gave me advice because I had met him before I started the podcast and he told me, um, get the Rolexes first <laughs> because then it's going to be easier to get other contracts. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what he did for his watch business and blew it up super fast compared to his competitors. So that's what I did is I just went after like really big names really quick. Mm-hmm. And I realized that the biggest names, if you have like a podcast book or whatever, a lot of times they have an assistant or their own podcast booker um, that like is already in a report to where like if they're in a relationship, a lot of times, like when I interviewed JP or when I connected with uh, Jordan Belfort or even when I connected with Tony Robbins, a lot of those came from personal relationships behind the scenes, more so than those guys uh, like vetting me personally or whatever it is. Yeah, their their right hand person said, yeah, no, he's good. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. So if you have a, a guy or a gal that's managing that, it just becomes an anchor of opportunity for that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely don't do that right now. We have no like <laughs> formal system at all. Yeah. And um, we made it this far. So that's good. But You're doing I, something right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally, uh, I, I just know, like I said, we can step it up and take it to a whole nother level. And I want to be intentional with the guests we get, you mm-hmm. know? And um, man, we've had great guests. I mean, we've had, I can't even name them all off the top of my head. You know, Cardone, Patrick Bed David, Ryan Serhant, you know, Hormozy, you know, professional athletes, Derek Carr, Chris Bryant. Yeah, I saw those you actually. Know, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, a very wide range of 
you know, A-list people essentially. Mm-hmm. And um, I know there's a ton of other guys that we can get as well as these other guys who are very high level performers who aren't like social media. No, yeah. You know, and I, I want to get those guys too because yeah. they, they know a lot. Yeah. And sometimes that gives you a competitive edge because their story is so unique that they're not on other platforms. I'm sure you've seen it where... You know, the now, guy. Yeah. And nowadays there's a lot of people who are on a lot of different platforms. So it's not as special, so to speak, as like you get like an exclusive or whatever, you know? So when you're look, if you're looking at those off market, like kind of like off market deals, if you're looking at those off market stories, that gives you a lot of, uh, I think, competitive edge when it comes to podcasting, especially because you have dudes like the Nell guys who are so well connected that they just interviewed Elon. I know. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, I, you know, with all due respect, props to it, but I don't know if that's the type of interview that I would have done if I was with Elon, you know, but nonetheless, they're, they got Elon, so they get the eyeballs, you know? So. Yeah, they had, they had Elon one week after having like Andrew Tate the, the prior week. Yeah, exactly. At his peak of fame. What are your thoughts off record? Or I guess on record. On record. On Andrew Tate. Dude, you know what's so funny? <laughs> <laughs> this is so All funny. All room's cracking up right now. No, because it was on the vlog. I was Somebody was here for the podcast like three or four weeks ago. Yeah. And they're like, dude, what do you think of Andrew Tate? I'm like, who's Andrew Tate? I don't even know. And then um, they're like, he's this jujitsu guy, kickboxer. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like that was their description of him. And then <laughs> I was like, that's cool. Like whatever. And then somebody else asked me about him. And then uh, my video guy, Austin, was like, dude, you haven't seen Andrew Tate? I'm like, dude, I don't even watch social media half the time. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. And then, I, dude, after hearing it so many times, like, Larry, who is this guy? And then I just went down this rabbit hole. And I was like, <laughs> what is going, where am I? This yeah. is like the twilight zone. But um, here's what I will say. I mean, regardless of what you, you know, think about his views, um, I think I can learn from everybody. And so I look at him and I'm like, this guy's a marketing genius. Totally. And um, the way that he went about it and the way that he's built his um, education program and the way that he speaks and sparks just pisses people off on purpose. Yeah. Like that dude is smart. Yeah. Now, you know, when he says weird things like he's a God fearing man, he's got, you know, a hundred girlfriends and all that. I'm like, I don't know what you got going on there, but uh, he's got a hair. You on. are smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's crazy too, because talking about how he does his marketing, like you're familiar with how he runs his course and affiliates. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So like, like, check out for anybody listening, this is how Andrew Tate blew up on social media. So he basically, he didn't even have a TikTok account Mm -hmm. and he basically came up with his course, the Hustlers University. I think it's like 50 bucks a month. And then creators can become affiliates of the program, which means if they sell it, they get a commission. And I believe they have to be in the program paying to get a commission and promote it. So what does that do? It triggers them to repurpose and edit all of Andrew Tate content across social. So they're editing his content for free, building his brand for free, and selling his course for free. <laughs> it's great. It's like totally vertically aligned and all he does with sunglasses, smoke a cigar, and shares. Just views. talk crap. Yeah, it's 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 crazy vertical integration. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would love to interview him. I should reach out to him because uh I think yeah, he's hilarious sure. just watching like what he does. I'm like, this guy is crazy. Yeah. Um, but you know, and here's the other part of it too, is like so many people are so offended by him and what he says. And like, mm-hmm. I just kind of like now look at it and I'm thinking, why do people get so freaking wrapped up about what somebody else thinks? Yeah, exactly. Like who cares? Freaking yeah. just don't watch him if you don't like him. Yeah. I think, I think that's one of the challenges with social media. It creates, um, it creates a, a, it becomes hard to gauge of opinions from facts, from perspectives, because it all just gets lumped in the same. And so if people get triggered, people jump on the bandwagon of the trigger and then some people feel justified and then it gets louder and then, but, it, but you're talking about him, so he'll do it more. It just becomes <laughs> this big, you know what I mean? It's just, it's so hard to quality control social media that it's, you know. It's well, you just, know, you like, know. you know, and who knows what's going to happen with him, but, you know, he recently at the time of filming this got banned from Instagram everything. and Facebook. Oh, just everything. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. But you can't even ban him because all his, his army is just going to post his stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. That's, yeah, that's like, a business model right there when you're literally unbannable. Yeah. Because everyone else will repost your stuff and you got an army. You're ban proof. Yeah. It's crazy. It's wild. But it also goes to show that like social media works. You know, whether you disagree with them, like them, don't like them, it works, you know? You know what Cardone said um, at his event was that 
he wants people to hate him. Like you need 50% of people to hate you in order to be the president. You need 50% of people, like a lot of people got to dislike you to be known. That's why Andrew, yeah. people are talking about Andrew Tate. Like there are, you know, people who strongly dislike him, right? Especially women. Women hate him. You yeah, know? totally. And it's just like, well, apparently a hundred of them don't, but a <laughs> hundred his of them. wives yeah, or whatever. His hundred wives and girlfriends. Yeah. yeah, they're, they're cool. But, uh, yeah, it's just like, look, it, regardless of how you feel about him, the guy accomplished his goal. Yeah, no, yeah, totally. And w- what's crazy too, and, and it, um, it's kind of interesting. It's ki- kind of like off topic, but it's kind of related is when we were talking about like, uh, the one thing that you noticed, um, that I've learned from all these successful people that I've met. One of the things is like time horizon, uh, the time horizon they think in. And Grant talked to me about this once we were off camera and I was, I was like, damn, I wish we filmed it. But he was saying two things, but the first thing was he was saying that like the poorest people think in terms of hourly pay, the longest think in terms of decades. So like, for example, somebody who gets paid minimum wage focuses on the hour. Somebody who makes us under six figures focuses on their salary for the month. Someone who makes multiple six figures is probably thinking quarterly. And somebody who's making millions is usually thinking a couple years at a time. People making tens of millions or hundreds of millions are thinking in decades at a time. And people, you know, talking about billions are thinking over the course of a long-term investment portfolio. Mm -hmm. So like the time horizon with which you think with totally affects your decision making. And, um, and, and Grant was telling me how like, kind of like what you were saying about even if uh, people hate you, he said, if you create so much content that you just have to out hustle their hate. Mm-hmm. So even if they hate your first 450 videos, no problem. I got 5,000 more coming <laughs> over the next five years. One yeah. of them is going to hit you. you know, I'm sure a lot of people are like, it happened to me. I'll be honest. Like I love Gary Vee, but I went through phases where I'm like, oh my God, I get it. You know, like I'm tired of the same stuff over and over. But then he just creates so much that I only have to like three or four or five to go, ah, you know what? I actually like this guy. So I think that that's also part of the equation is on a long enough time horizon, if you create value, people will remember what they like and forget what they don't. Yeah. No, I agree with you, dude. <laughs> well, bro, I appreciate you coming out to Vegas, man. I had a blast on your show. Um, and I think it's amazing what you're doing, interviewing all these people. I think your questions and the way you can pull things out of these people is definitely a skill that very few podcast hosts have. Thank you, man. So, um, that. shout out to you. And, um, Everyone listening, you know, make sure you go give Omar a follow. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Omar, thank you, bro. Appreciate you for coming out. Thanks so much. What would be like your basic investing 101? You can't control the result or the outcome. All you can focus on is the process as an investor because you're always just playing games of probability. I got rich pretty quickly from being broke. What it comes down to is 